Hi, I'm Gloria Calderon Kellett. I just made myself a fresh cup of coffee. I'm ready great. to get into it. People may know you as the creator of One Day at a Time. This iteration, the one that is currently on the air. If I IMDb'd you, what are some of the other shows? You that find people that you? I was on How I Met Your Mother and Rules of Engagement and Devious Maids, and that I've directed uh, Mad About You and Mystery Glacias. And you're also an actor. I am. And a wife and a mom. Yep. What don't you do? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> now everything. So you kind of do it all and then now you're doing it in quarantine. Yep. That's relatable. I do have a lot of help. I think that in order to do all of this, you need a lot of help. And right now you can't have a lot of help. So I think it's been incredibly humbling. I feel like we can just avoid the conversation about how production is going to work because we still, the answer is we don't know. But you were in a writer's room for a number of weeks, correct? Yes, yes many weeks. Uh, I would say four weeks we did the writer's room virtually on Zoom. And it was great. We finished the scene. We wrote all the episodes. Everything is tabled. We have 13 episodes that have been tabled and are ready to go. Did you find that it felt very different? Weirdly, because we had already been in a room together, we all knew each other already. I think starting would have been different. It takes a little longer. I think if we were in the room, things would have been quicker. Mm -hmm. But it's nice to still be able to get work done during this time, certainly. One of the reasons I was inspired to just start calling great writers that I know is because everyone is having a different relationship to their own writing right now. Some are saying it flows, it's fine. Some are saying not, but the thing I think a hundred percent of writers, certainly hundred percent of writers I've ever talked to, what we all have in common is sometimes it's really fucking hard to sit down and write. Yeah. We all went through that period where we were trying to figure out how to be a writer and we ran up against all kinds of resistance. And so right now is this time for people that is both an incredible amount of mental stress and pressure but also for some an opportunity because they're home, there's less distraction perhaps, or there's a little more control over the hours that you have in front of your laptop. And so they're sitting down to do that thing you did when you became a writer. Totally. When did you become a writer? I became a writer my senior year of college. I was frustrated with the amount of stuff that was out there. There was a playwright competition. We were getting a lot of like really angsty material and I just wanted something fun and funny. And so I wrote a romantic comedy piece really fast and I submitted it and it got into the festival and then won the festival. You know, as an actor, I never get nervous, but as a writer, I was so nervous hearing, like sitting in the back and hearing them say the words. And I was just like, oh my God, like it's so, it's so much more. When you're an actor, you hide behind something. You're hiding behind the character. When you're writing, it's like balls on the table. I mean, it just feels so exposing. Uh, and I kind of loved it. And I also really loved the control. Like you, any other, you know, so many art forms, you're reliant on somebody else to give you permission to do the thing. With writing, everybody can write every day if they want to, if they're disciplined and they want to do that. But I was still an actor. My, I was primarily an actor and I went to grad school. I went to University of London, went to proper drama school. And when I came back, all of the parts were gangbanger's girlfriend and gangbanger's sister. Mm -hmm. So it was like, all right, uh, if anything's going to change, I think I need to lean into this other thing a little bit more. And so I started writing the horse in that direction. I started easing up on the acting and just focusing more on the writing, really as a means to act, right? I, I yeah. want to create parts for myself. Because part of your inspiration to move into taking writing more seriously and, and putting it more in the forefront of, of your attention and your discipline, you're saying that a huge motivation or a huge inspiration was just that the rules for Latinas were such bullshit. And for women, both. Yeah. It was like, what? It was always in service of a white male character. It was always like, I was just <laughs> like, I don't, I, I just want to be like more than, you know, Mr. Mr. Watson, your tea is here. I mean, like... I, <laughs> Like, it was literally uh -huh. a waitress or, like, Chewy, put the gun down. Orale. Like, that was it. That was <laughs> it. It's like, what? Like, I can't have a thought. I can't, like, it just felt like it, the only way to change it is to do it. I'm fortunate in that way in that I'm the daughter of immigrants, right? So it's like, mm -hmm. one's going to do it for you. Prince Charming ain't coming, girl. You got to, you know, like, you got to be your own savior. And that really made such an impression on me because I was always like, mm -hmm. if, I want some, if I want the house, I got to get the house. If I want the car, I got to get the car. If I want my kids to go to this kind of school, I got to make that happen. Like, and it's very empowering. It's really mm -hmm. empowering because you're like, oh, I can, I can do that. I can do that. I can make that shit happen. I'm also first generation American. Oh my God. I've always 
wondered what the percentage of immigrant and first generation showrunners is. You know, one thing we have in common is when when I'm on a panel or in an interview and they're asking about our show, the fact that I'm a woman usually comes out. And it's fine. I like being a girl. Me too. Being a lady's cool. And then here is something I'm curious of about and aware of. I'm white. I'm technically a white passing ethnic minority, but since but so am I. You know, having a, like your t-shirt says, a Latina identity, a Latinx identity, that becomes another layer of the question yes. that gets asked. You know, I feel like the best practice, certainly in a writer's room where we have all different kinds of writers from all different kinds of situations, it's like my best practice is never to ask someone to be a representative of an entire community. That I want to hear your experience and I really want it to be specific and let's really try to make an environment and an atmosphere where that's true, but I've never hired anyone because they're a Latina. But yeah. I think you're rare though. I mean, you're a bit, you, do you think that comes because of your perspective as an immigrant kid? Like, do you think that you're more sensitive to that? I mean, maybe I honestly, I frequent, specifically with the immigrant thing, I have frequently felt like I'm an interloper into conversations because people will say they're bullshit when I'm in the room because they don't know that I'm secretly in the other community. Maybe I straddle that fence enough that I'm just aware of it. Not like I'm going to be able to strap on any kind of cape, more just that I really see the matrix of the extra pressure that's put on a writer like you, where you become identified with more than one kind of community. And then that comes up every fucking time. I'm just curious about your relationship to it. It comes up. Well, it's very interesting. So because I am very white passing, there have been, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of times where people assume I'm Italian or Greek or, Mm -hmm. so I've never talked so much about being Latina that I have the last three years that I've done this show. Because when you're in a community, you're just that. So you don't, think about it, right? Like, I don't wake up and go like, I'm a Latina woman walking through the world. You know what I mean? Like, I do feel female, but I identify with the non-binary because when I wake up, I think I'm a person. I don't even really feel female or Latina or anything until I'm in the world and it's reflected back on me in some way. Mm -hmm. So to be talking about it so much is really strange to me because when people Mm -hmm. ask you about it, it's as though like you're a zoo animal, like tell us about the Latino people. And it's like, dude, we're, we're, we care about our kids. I don't know. It's just for you. <laughs> it's kind of been nice to show like, this is kind of who we are and we're just normal everyday people. But mm-hmm. I understand that we seem exotic because you don't see us. We're, you know, 18% of the population. We're like, what, three to 5% of what's on TV now. It's crazy. I mean, I don't even really know how to respond to that because the whole, the, situ- the situation that you're talking about is so wildly egregious. So this, my putting little interviews on the internet, is watched by a lot of writers who are trying to break into the industry, young or new writers who are trying to discover their own voice. Yeah. And we all put a lot of pressure on ourselves when we're doing that. Each of us has to figure out how our various identities fit into that. But I'm just really interested to hear you talk about that in a world where, you know, it's not deniable that this is something that people lead with when they talk to you about your work now. I think about it in terms of Tanya and I a lot because both of us are very white passing. Tanya Siracho is the other Mm -hmm. Latina showrunner. And Mm. so I do, I am sort of concerned. We're the two most prominent Latina showrunners right now and we're very white. Like I would love to see a very indigenous looking Mm. Latina get as much attention as we are getting because Mm. I feel like people will forget like is it are right. we are we more palpable to have around is it more comfortable for the masses to have us on a panel you know like i i i worry about that i worry about our lack of of pigment being all that's represented because you know latinos are many different colors afro latinos chino latino like there is masses of people that are out there that are not represented but then at the same time i'm also relieved to see characters on television be latino and it's not all about their latinidad that's actually what i really appreciated about you is you had these two girls that were living that happened to be a latino sisters that lived mm-hmm. in the building and it wasn't all about them being latinos it was just they happened to live in the building right like that mm-hmm. That's actually really important too. What, what I, you want is all of that. You want all yeah. of them to start to filter for there to be really equity. I have a working theory about this. When I watch creators, especially female creators, creators of color talking about their work, I think that there's a really, because of the statistic you're talking about, the percentage that you're talking about, there's such an unfair expectation of carrying more than one point of view. It's like, 
there's a lot of Indian Americans, but one Mindy Kaling is the example that I've used a couple times, right? And so it's easy for me to say, to stand back and be like, what we need is more because then the onus won't be on Gloria yes. to speak for oh, every God. Latina from every place in the world. Wait, so there's more. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. Here's the thing that I'm trying to kind of zero in on about it. It's like, though, this is very fascinating. One of the purposes of this conversation was not to continue to put you on the hot, spe- hot seat of... <laughs> in a different context, Sarah. You're asking in a different context. In my Thank defense, you. you're wearing the t-shirt. <laughs> you know what's funny? I literally just threw this on. So, so my question is this. It's like, I play a lot of mind games with myself, some of which are not helpful, that intimidate me out of writing. Like what? But, you tell me, like what? You know, like I, I identify the various members of the committee in my head. And then I tell them to shut up one by one, for example. Or I sit down and I say, I'm going to write this and make sure it's the shittiest thing I've ever written. And then the pressure is off. All of these voices we're talking about, all of these things, all they do is add more pressure. The job of a writer for the first several years of our path is just to figure out how the fuck to write. So we just spent a few minutes talking about something that's real, that takes your bandwidth and your time, some of which is a pleasure for you and some of which is annoying or do you know what I mean? Or that like you accept as part of the deal but it is part of your bandwidth, right? Yeah. So I'm picturing, I'm picturing a girl, I'm picturing a young boy, I'm picturing somebody who's like, I, I'm a writer, I've always been a writer, I don't know, I don't know what to do next. And then their bandwidth is being pulled in all these directions because they see what it's even like when you're professional. And so I'm just curious to hear what you say to them. I think it's quieting all those voices and also trying to really listen to that part of you that feels like they have something to say. It's audacious being a writer, mm-hmm. right? Because we are ultimately saying that we that our thoughts are things that should be out there. And <laughs> that we are ap- apologetic about it constantly. And it's like, you kind of have to get over the apology. You have to get over it. Because if you feel like you have something to say, then you should say it. And so I think that the fight is often that, like, who am I to, to, to write thoughts down, right? Like, I'm constantly just, as an artist, trying to figure out, like, what do I have to say today? What am I trying to put into the world to make it better or make it think about things or, or make a comment? Like, especially as I'm going into, you know, I'm, my, my Amazon deal starts June 1st. So it's like, mm. I'm about to transition into creating a show again, as opposed to running an already existing show. And it's been interesting to sort of try to quiet all the, you know, like, what are they going to say if the next thing isn't as good as this? And it's like, I have to make peace with the fact that I might not write something again that people like as much as one day at a time. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. I got to do that. And that was really, people were really nice to me about it. So, you know, you, you expect the hate and you're sort, I'm sort of stunned by the love. Mm -hmm. I'm sort of, you know, whenever an episode comes out, it's like, all right, we did the fucking masturbation episode. Bring it on fuckers. Bring it out. What are you going to say about women's pleasure and how we should all have our clits cut off? I don't know. Like what? (laughs) And then, so you're, then it's like, oh, thank you, Gloria, for writing about female pleasure. Oh, I love that they're talking about intergenerational. I'm like, oh, like I'm almost like stuck. Like, like I've been in bad relationships and I'm expecting, you Mm -hmm. know, Sarah, we, I don't feel like we're any different really than we were when we started. The hustle Mm. is the same. It is, yeah. You are always looking for your next job. You are always trying to be better than your last script. You're always Mm -hmm. trying to evolve, right? So I don't feel that I'm that different from the girl that didn't know anything that was starting out. I just have better tools in my tool chest. I just know how to craft a scene now. I know how to do an outline. I know, like, I've just gotten better because I put my 10,000 hours towards all that stuff. So I'm better at it. But all of the same fears and all of the same stuff is there. So I would just tell them like they have to try to quiet down the negativity, focus on what they feel they have to say and why they have to say it, and then put that pen to paper. When I first started writing, I never outlined. I had the luxury of being, you know, young and just going like, I'm going to write when the, when the inspiration hits me. Mm -hmm. And I think that the big transition was realizing you can't wait for Cupid's arrow. You got to just do it. You know, like you, the, the, it becomes a job when you, when that is no longer an option where you have to get into the mode of constantly doing it every day in some capacity, thinking about it, breaking it down and rewriting was something that took me a long time to get into. Mm and realizing the value of it because there was something about me that liked the purity of like, and there it is. And that feels real. (laughs) Rewriting is essential. Rewriting is so important. I vaguely remember this moment where I suddenly saw the matrix and I was like, when I cut 
the extra lines, the lines that remain make me sound a lot funnier and cooler than I am because I'm only keeping the good shit. Anything that's not an A plus goes. And suddenly everyone's real fucking witty on the entire page. There was a long period of time where my first drafts would be like 85 pages long. I mean, I was writing one hours, but 85, 90 pages long because I would sort of secretly be taking a run at every version of a joke or a quip or a retort and then giving them their day in court and then cutting any, right? In life, I'm not brief. I'm not concise. I don't always come out with the best one-liner, but my characters do because I rewrite them until yeah. they do. I have questions about being funny because okay. you're, among other things, a comedy writer, that you are all kinds of writers. Did you always consider yourself to be funny? Did you always know that was uh, that you were going to go into a comedic avenue with your writing? I have a moment that's like, it's from like a movie. It's in my head and I remember it very vividly. So I, I grew up in Portland, Oregon and in a little Cuban community and then a very white, beautiful white uh, uh, world that was Portland. They were very nice to us. When I was 14, we moved to San Diego. And in Portland, I felt like I was cute, I was popular, I was, right? When I moved to San Diego and I started high school with all of these Southern Californian kids who were tanned and sun-kissed, I felt like the ugliest duckling in the entire world. And I remember going to a party and I walked into the party with my beautiful friend Katie and all the boys are just in love with Katie, of course, and they want to be my friend so that they can talk to Katie. And I remember talking to the guys and I, I was making jokes and they liked hanging out with me. And I was like, oh, they might think she's pretty, but they want to hang out with me. And that felt very powerful. So then it became, I don't give a shit if I'm not the prettiest girl in the room because I can be the funniest girl in the room. That really informed who I became, I think, in high school. So I did know I was funny. I did mm -hmm. know that. And I felt incredible confidence from being funny and being witty. So it was the thing that I felt the most grounded in. Did you do the thing where you wrote your specs and your samples to break in on into TV? So I did write some samples, but I wrote plays. So I went to grad school. I went mm -hmm. to University of London for performance and playwriting. And I was like writing monologues. I was doing stand up. Um, and the stand up, I was, it was super male dominated when I was doing stand up. I would go in there and all the guys would be out smoking and not giving a shit. And the moment I would go on, all the guys would come back in and stand in the back and just like go like this. Like, what does she got? And then afterwards, you know, they'd be like, hey, you're pretty funny. And then they all try to fuck you. Uh, you know, that was kind of how it went. So it was, it was a different era. It was a different, I think S Sarah Silverman was kind of the only one that was making waves. And mm -hmm. I realized I didn't love the joke, joke, joke aspect of it. I liked the storytelling aspect of it. So I started writing monologue shows. It was always women mm -hmm. are funny, women aren't funny, women aren't funny. The monologue shows were all female and all funny. And I went to all my favorite charities and I gave them free tickets. It was a 15 woman monologue show. I gave all of the actors two tickets to the first two shows. And then I found out that Backstage West and LA Weekly only review a show if it's six weeks, if it's a six week run. Ugh. So I found a theater, the Hudson Avenue Theater on Santa Monica. Uh -huh. I yeah. feel like I did a play there. Yeah. So I was uh -huh. like, what is your, what's the dead night for you guys? And they're like, like Tuesdays or Wednesdays. So I would book the Hudson for six Tuesdays in a row, get reviewed. The first two nights that the reviewers were there were sold out because it's mm -hmm. all freaking free tickets. And then the agents and managers came. As soon as I got the agent and manager, the first thing they said is we need you to get your specs together. I had already known about that. I was going to the Museum of TV and Radio, which is now the Paley Center, and like been watching shows and breaking them down and like teaching myself comedy writing. Yeah. I watched everything. I watched like My So-Called Life, Mad About You, Wonder Year. I mean, I broke mm. down all of those scripts, all the Norman Lear stuff. And then I wrote like a Sex in the City and an Everybody Loves Raymond. And those are what got me in rooms. And those, and the plays, the monologues and the plays. And people mm -hmm. liked actually reading my monologues and plays more because it was so fast. Like, I love reading uh, plays read and plays. chapters <laughs> and short stories. I always welcome them. I just want to know that there's a script as backup. I usually don't read it. I just want to know that they've written one. But to go back, you just said there was so much fucking gold in this story you just told us. There's so many things. I'm just going to highlight them for the people just briefly. Do it. Because first of all, you just figured some shit out. 
you just DIY'd a way to get managers. And it, you know, it's like you did a little research, you figured out what the minimum requirement is to get the kind of attention you needed to just get in the door. It's like you didn't wait for somebody to tell you how to do it. There's something scrappy in a way that almost every person I talk to has a story like this, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I wrote with my writing partner at the time, we wrote scripts, we put them in competitions. We went on reality TV, like, <laughs> you know, like there, nobody said go on reality TV. Some would say don't do that, but you know, sure. we sort of fall, we were following our noses, but we had the same question over and over again, which is just how do we get seen? How do we get more experience? I feel like if I met you today and you were 20 and you were like, I know I'm funny. I know I have to cut through the noise. The shape of your story might include YouTube or yep. it might include making a movie on your phone. The substance of it is the same though, where it's just yeah. like, what do I need for an agent and manager to pay a little attention? And then the idea, by the way, just to compare and contrast, like I had no fucking idea what kind of writer I was going to end up being. I just like to shine the, the brightest flashlight possible on it when writers admit publicly that their path was not a straight line and that you didn't necessarily start out going, you know, so what I think I'm going to do is a family show. No. That's a comedy. That's a reboot. That's this. No. That allows me to talk about this and this and this. No. You, you did a bunch of stuff along the way to discover no. who you are today. <laughs> It was 12 years. Like, it's such a weird thing to be getting press now. I've been a journeyman writer for 12 years. I mean, I was on other people's shows for years. How many rather three years until I left to have a baby? Rules of engagement, three years until I left to have a baby. Like, people don't understand the, the complexities of that, of how when you're a journeyman writer, you got to mm -hmm. go from show to show to, to pay your bills. And the whole concept of an overall was something I heard that men got. And I wanted one of those. I wanted one of those where I wasn't like feast or famine every single year, but it took mm -hmm. forever to get one. And I had to be incredibly media savvy to get one. I did a whole media campaign for myself that ended up getting me that overall. That first really? overall. Really? Yes. Yes. First season of One Day at a Time. Mike Royce was such a generous and loving and wonderful partner, always lifting me up and saying like, dude, she's doing great. She's, we're partners. Like people would go to him and he'd be like, no, 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 we're equal here. And then after One Day at a Time came out and we were really well reviewed, we tried to get me an overall and Sony said, we don't know her voice. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Cause I just, there's a lot of articles. Okay, okay. So <laughs> I said, I'm gonna get a publicist. I'm gonna get a publicist. And I'm going to make it very clear what my voice is. And I'm going to do every, I said yes to every panel, every podcast, every, I said yes to mm -hmm. everything. And I feel like I was so sick of myself by the end of it because I was inundating the culture with articles. And then finally, Sony was like, all right, we'll put her on an overall. And then I was their lowest overall, <laughs> their least, their cheapest overall. That's why, <laughs> that's why I went to Amazon, guys. I, I feel like uh, there is so much fairy dust and mystique around Hollywood, it's a self-generating glitter machine. That narrative that you get chosen is so strong. First of all, like being a writer is like being a fucking ballet dancer. Like you have to show up to the bar or you're just gonna be squishy and not flexible and you're not gonna be able to do it. So yeah. there's that, right? The, the hard work doesn't disappear, it just increases. Yep. But the thing that you're saying is that you chose your you chose yourself like you didn't buy the bullshit you didn't buy the idea that like people just see your gifts you were brave enough and smart enough as a businesswoman to just play the game immigrant kid again like i didn't mm -hmm. know about money no one talked to me about money nobody money was always just something that we didn't have right like it was mm -hmm. hard to get that three jobs to so i could take a class i that's all i knew so the idea of investing and investing in the self and invest, like that was all hard and publicists are expensive. It's expensive, but I really mm -hmm. did sit down and go, I need to invest in myself because it will pay off if it does. And then it's it. I think we do have to be business savvy. My first overall started this year too. I had a few people that I looked up to that were a few years ahead of me in the business. And we're very similar. Even our time frames are similar, you and I, and there's a few of us and we see each other yeah. panels and uh you know at those uh cocktail things sometimes it's never a coincidence that all of us are in the same place we are all investing in putting our voices out there there and to me this was not automatic like same thing as a child of refugees like there was a really strong message in my household to not obviously be the best obviously be twice as good as the next person because yeah. that's the absolute minimum that you should put in the bank to just not get in you know the legacy of my family carted off by nazis but it's different for everyone but there was also a sense of just put your head down and fucking work so for me to graduate from over a decade of just assiduously working my way up a ladder 
that was about being the most undeniably responsible, creative person in a good mood, never the person who's a problem or a diva, always the person with a, with a solution to say, no, I think that there's like a new job for me, which is to be brave enough to claim my voice and my place in a bigger landscape. That's been more challenging. I can stay up all night and write for the rest of my fucking life. I can work harder than everyone else in the room forever. The thing of saying, I believe I have something specific and worth, wor worthwhile to say, you know, as we, you and I and our little graduating class step into these leadership positions, I don't know, I'm getting a little emotional hearing you talk about it because I feel the same. There was, there's no doubt in my mind that you have to speak and be as loud as you can and have as many people know you as can. I don't know what my point is, except that you're setting an example that I love. <laughs> Sarah, so are you, so are you. I just think it's good to tell the truth about what actually goes into this job and that if people have this burning desire to write, then there's a part where like every person I talk to is saying a version of the same fucking thing, which is you have to sit down and write. You have to find a way to shut up the part of you that doesn't want to write today and just yeah. keep writing till your writing is good, 10,000 hours. Then there's the other thing you're talking about, which can be happening par in parallel and just a little different part of your brain. As an experiment, I'm gonna see if like, as this goes along, I can start to claim the importance of my own voice. I think part of the confidence, the true confidence that I hear from you is just because you did that 10 years, that 13 years. Like, that's yeah. not deniable. That's the thing that I worry about with new writers coming in, is that I actually think the 10 year struggle of being in other rooms Mm -hmm. was valuable. I wish that somebody had said, your job is not to write Gloria's version of this script. Your job is to be in service of the showrunner. Because I felt like I needed to bring my unique voice to this show. And that's not the case. I needed to be a mimic to the in service of whatever that showrunner wanted. And it mm -hmm. didn't matter if I, Gloria, didn't want the story to go that way. I mean, there were rooms where I was like, mm, I don't, I wanted mm -hmm. to that. I don't want that character to do that. It's not my job. My job is not to, my job is to say, oh, you want it to go that way? Cool. I'm going to give you five ways it can go that way. Like that was stuff I had to navigate after the first few years. And then you're like, oh, right. The way I can be in service, the way I can be invaluable as a member of this staff is to just be a pitching machine. At first, already because I was a woman and I was new and I was Latina, I felt mm -hmm. it was hard for me to talk. Right? Like, mm. and I'm not somebody that has a hard time talking. But the <laughs> rooms also, like, they were so, the Ivy League of it all, there was a lot of, yeah. like, perverted. And I was like, shit, I just went to LMU. You know, like, I felt stupid. I felt not good enough. I felt like I'm the diversity hire. I felt, so all of that weighed on me in a way that made me nervous to say something. And once I realized that, like, don't give, who cares? Just provide solutions. Mm -hmm. Once that click happened, I actually feel like I became a better member on a staff. I think that the thing you're saying is so valuable to people who are starting to take meetings now. People ask a lot about like, what do I do to prepare for a meeting? How am I supposed to present myself? And it's like the things that got you in the room when you were on staff before you had your own show are like all of the stuff that make you Gloria, like your point of view, your history, the kind of stuff that you wrote about in your sample, all of those were relevant to the Tetris of making a writer's room that felt the way the showrunner wanted. But once you're in the room, get as closely lined up with the showrunner's brain as possible and pitch yeah. things that solve her or his problem. The way this, I'm just going to be a translator now. Here's how to take a meeting when you're trying to get on somebody's show. Be really familiar with the show. Tell them who you are. Your sample should tell them who you are. That tells the showrunner who is going to show up in the room every day and why is their life experience interesting and different than every other dude in the room. But then pitch on the show. Somebody said television is a beast that eats scripts and shits episodes. It's like, that fucker is hungry. Yes. I just want people who have ideas, who are inspired and have ideas based on this premise. Anyway, so what you're saying is crucially important. That was an amazing, an amazing sum up too. Look at us complimenting each other. We're such girls. Anyone who's curious and wondering and going, you know, there's not very many women who are showrunners. That's correct. Yes, that's true. I almost sort of get asked this question about like, do you feel in competition? Like I have yet to meet a showrunner who happens to be a woman who's a bitch about it. <laughs> you know, I just... No, that's true. It's always like, a, it's always like, oh my God, hi. <laughs> it's like a, a relative that you didn't know that you're meeting for the first time. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's such a delight. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to let you go in a minute, but I just am like, if you have any like little tips that you keep in your pocket, like when you're having a, an especially hard day. I know deadlines are our friend in this. Yes. The stuff that I'm actively working on, all of them are with another person. 
I think that's been really helpful to me in this moment because it does make me feel like I'm in connection. I'm in brainstorming with another person. And that mm-hmm. feels so nice. I think that's sort of what's been getting me through quarantine is the normalcy of daily story breaking, the normalcy of daily outline writing or script writing with someone else to bounce things off of. It's felt really rejuvenating and really nice. I always tell people they have to find their community. That's always one of my big ones to college graduates. Like Mm -hmm. you gotta find your people because no one's gonna read your stuff for a long time. Mm -hmm. So you don't want me to be the first person that reads your script. You want that script to be read by a ton of other people and get a ton of other notes from them. I had people that like, I would read their stuff. We had a similar sensibility. I thought they were good and smart. I would read their stuff, they would read my stuff. And that I would have like one or two people that we'd always read each other's work. Everyone should do that. I mean, everyone should cultivate, if you don't have that person, cultivate an existence, especially right now. I'm sure there are Zoom meetings happening and writers that are meeting for Zoom Mm -hmm. cocktails. If they're not, they should be, right? Like, that's something that you can do right now is cultivate a weekly Monday night writer's room where all of, you know, where you and your college friends or your young writer friends or your old writer friends or whatever are coming together and talking about process or... I'm having trouble with second acts. I know second acts are the worst, but whatever. Like, I think that can be something that can be really helpful for people. And certainly something that I would be doing if I didn't already have this accountability to someone mm-hmm. else. Hit up somebody you know who's in the same position or do some other kind of a trade or just start being friendly on social media and see who you meet, who can be your Zoom buddy during this time, right? It's like a secret benefit of being in a fandom because that's a way that people make online community around TV shows. Mm-hmm. I would pick the person who's writing the best fan fiction, reach out to them and be like, yo, I know. <laughs> you know, can you read my thing? Can I read your thing? Do you want to? My daughter is writing fan fiction for My Hero Academia with her other 12 year old best friend. Yeah, I don't get to read it because of course that's after school, they sit and they like write My Hero Academia fan fiction. Um, so you're now a dynasty, a multi-generation we'll writer see. dynasty. She's pretty, she's a remarkable kid. So maybe. That's amazing. This has been fantastic. You're the best, Sarah. I just love seeing you too.